This is the end of an era. This will be the last time I will be shooting in this studio because we just purchased a brand new forever home and we are moving like in two days. <laughs> if you could see right behind the camera, you'd see a whole ton of moving boxes. It's mayhem, it's crazy. But before I did that, I really wanted to come full circle in the studio. This is where it really all began for me. I mean, it didn't always look like this in the beginning, but YouTube has been fantastic. I wanted to take a look back at my top 10 DIYs of 2023. So let's get right into that. The first one is a DIY that actually did not get Get a ton of views but I wanted to share it in this one because it was one of my favorites of the whole entire year and that was my DIY grandfather clock. This DIY really stretched me but it helped me to learn some new skills and I was really pleased with the final result so let's take a look back at that project. I was inspired by this Howard Miller very expensive clock. It was I think originally retails for around $3,000 on sale. You can get it at the bargain price of $2,300 but I wanted to see if I could do it for under a hundred bucks. So the first thing I did is I needed to find like a clock face that, that really spoke to me, kind of replicated that. And I saw one in the Hobby Lobby clearance aisle for about $10. It was 90% off. It was originally retailed for a hundred bucks. It was a little worse for wear. <laughs> Anybody else might have walked on by, but I'm like, I bet we could fix that up. Let's see if we can make this work. So the first thing we're gonna do is remove the clock face and then we can make the repairs to the frame portion. So we're gonna just pull this off. Okay, so there's some damage here, but we're gonna, like I said, put this back in the frame, but we're gonna set this aside um, because we've got some stuff to do and we don't want that to get damaged. Okay, I'm gonna remove any nails. So let's assess the damage here. Before I cut off this, I want to repair these cracks. So I am going to just fill it with wood glue and it doesn't really matter if we kind of make a mess because we're gonna be painting this anyway. So work that in. This is probably the most damaged area is this one side right here. Then we're gonna just clamp this in tight and you can see how it's gonna squeeze out that glue and I'll do more clamps. And then I set that aside to fully dry while we moved on to the main part of the clock. The first thing that I did is I took a one by 12 for the front um, by eight feet tall. And then I got two one by eight by six feet tall pieces of pine. And I really picked through to try to find the clearest one. What I did is I left them at those depths. So if you're, if you decide to replicate this, um, those are the depths is about eight inches deep, which let's be honest, the measurements aren't always exact. I think they're doing that to save money, <laughs> but an, a one by eight is really like one by seven and a half or something like that. But I would still go with the eight inches and then the one by 12 in the middle. And I cut off the excess. The total height that we were going for is 72 inches. That's why I went with the six foot side pieces, but I cut off that long piece on the top just to, to have that for another part of the clock in a, just a bit. But what we're gonna do is then I took it on my table saw and mitered the edges. Now, if you, this part makes you nervous, you could do a total butt joint and just join them like this with nails. I, I really do think that mitering the edge gave it a nice cleaner look in the end. So just keep that in mind. So what we're gonna do is we are going to glue these together and I've got these corner clamps that I'm hoping will help. So we'll just, Give this a go. Okay, we're gonna see if this works. That seems to work. <laughs> Okay, now I wanna flip this over because I think I want the nails to go in through the front side. And I just wanna make sure this is nice and tight. Okay, now we're gonna switch this to the other side.
Okay, now we're back to the clock face and we want to start the process of being able to attach it. But the first thing we need to do is cut down. It had this wood beaded trim on the outside. It did not go for the look that I was going for. So we're gonna take just a, a compass <laughs> and we are going to trace a circle. But before we do that, because we're gonna be cutting through it, I felt like we needed to pull these off and we're gonna have support. So we're gonna just hope these pry right off. I think they should. Yep, it looks like they're coming. <laughs> this over. This looks a little worse for wear, but I promise in the end it will look good. Okay, so we're gonna set this on eight centimeters or three inches. Okay, so now we're gonna start by drilling a pilot hole because this has wire in it. So we're gonna drill a pilot hole. We drilled a hole, cut around that as best I could, keeping it as circular as I can <laughs> and then we did a pretty good job but any imperfections I took I fixed by when I sanded it out I sanded off the edges and try to get that as even looking as possible okay so we've got our basic frame built and I set our clock head on top to kind of get a feel for how it's gonna look I'm excited um, we do need to cut out a hole right here um, to accommodate like the battery and the, the mechanics of our clock. So that's what we're gonna do right now. First thing we need to figure out is how big this is. I'm gonna make it bigger just to give us some wiggle room. And it's like just shy of two and a half. That's like two and a quarter each way. I'm gonna cut it like four inches just because. And then we're gonna measure six and 10, and then half is 11 and a half. So five and three quarters is middle. And then we're gonna do four and eight. That way we've got plenty of room. All right, so just cut that knot right out. Okay, so we're gonna cut that out. Okay, so not perfect, but it doesn't need to be. Okay, so we can set that there. And this gives us some wiggle room so we can move it to just where exactly we want it. We'll just set this on to see. Yeah, that gives us plenty of room. Okay, so what I am hoping to do right through here, and this is the tricky thing that I've never done before, is I want to curve around this clock so it's not flat. And masonite is too thick, it will break, especially when we're trying to go in this circular motion. I don't wanna leave this open. I will if I have to. As a last resort, I'll put a cap on this and we'll just leave it square, but that won't make me happy, I'll be honest with you. So here's what we're gonna do. Something called kerf bending. See, I wanna be able to see you, it's starting to fog up. <laughs> Kerf bending is something that I have never done before. And if you can get pole wrap, that actually may work for this. They don't sell it at my any of my home improvement stores near me, I would have had to order it in. So I'm gonna try this kerf bending technique and that's spelled K-E-R-F. And I'm gonna show you what we're gonna do. Basically, we're gonna make this plywood bend. So here we go. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we are gonna make a series of cuts um, against the grain. So this is the grains running this way, we're gonna cut it this way. But we don't want it to cut all the way through. So what we need to do is lower this blade. It lowers pretty easily. And basically, we want to cut it right up to this layer right here. So now we've got the blade to where we want. And then we're just gonna run it this way. And we're gonna do that every one quarter inch.
and I started cutting every one quarter inch. And this took me a little bit of time. My hands got a little sore. I should have worn gloves. If you do this, put on gloves. It, my hands got a little raw from the pushing. I didn't get like slivers or anything, but it just got over that repetitive motion. Um, but I did it. Okay, so this is where we're at right now. And let's move it this way. And there is definitely some give in it. I don't want to do anything with this yet because I think when you do this, it's best if it's like pressing up against something, but we can see that it is starting to bend. Um, but I'm gonna flip it over and do this end because my my table saw only goes out to like 12 inches. And so I'll get another 12 inches and then we're gonna have to like eyeball this in the center. So anyways, here we go. So I just eyeballed the middle stuff, but as you can see, this is gonna bend. I'm a little nervous about it still. So I'm gonna be done for tonight. I'm gonna go take a, sh a much needed shower. Um, but look at that. I think that that's gonna work. I'm gonna weigh my options about wetting the wood. Um, I feel like it will, if we take it a little bit at a time, I just, I don't know. I want to think on it. I want to get, all this dust off. Oh my word, look at this. Oh, gross. <laughs> Anyways, we're having fun and now hopefully we've got something that will go around our top. But if you can find an alternative to this, I would. <laughs> that was a lot of work. I was still a little nervous that it was not gonna bend enough. Before I attempted to do this, the first thing I did is I kind of miter cut this on the edge because when I met it up, I didn't want this like abrupt drop. And I thought if we mitered the edges on the curve bended wood, that this might, you know, get it a little bit snug and tight. Before I attached it, I decided, and this was the suggestion of my husband, he's like, why don't you just soak the wood? I'm like, with curve bending, you're not necessarily supposed to have to soak the wood. He's like, just soak it. It's pretty tight circumference that you're doing. So that was a good call. I did that, but I'm gonna tell you, <laughs> This part really frustrated and stretched me. I'll caveat, it did work out in the end, but I was like, oh my word, this is not working. I ended up taking off the clock face and moving it up because I thought that that was the problem. My brain was just not understanding how it wasn't working really well. And so I moved it up. In so doing, it actually kind of messed me up on how the end look, and I'll explain that in just a second. But what I did is I put a couple of trim pieces, cleats, and this was structural, but also to um, hide the seams a little bit be better in the end. And so I wood glued and cut down these little pieces of pencil molding. It's like a little decorative molding that's pretty thin. And I wood glued and nailed that into place. And that was to act as kind of a support and a cleat, um, but also, to create a natural decorative seam as well. So I kept trying to wrap it around and it just wasn't working. So then I soaked it again. It just was not going well. And then I had to go stop and take, pick my kids up from school. And while I was thinking about it, I'm like, you know, in all of the tutorials that it talked about curve bending, you really needed a lot more support than I had on my top clock face. I mean, there was a couple of points of support, but not as many as I needed. So I took a couple of pieces of scrap, um, two by two lumber, and I cut them down to the actual depth of the, the clock of where it would fit. And then I attached those in with some like toenail cleats and glue. I did end up adding a ton of glue in the seams of the, the curves. In, in between all the curves and I felt like that would give it a lot more structural integrity when it was all said and done. And then I nailed it into place with our finish nail and it worked. And I was like, phew, because that was the most challenging and difficult part was getting that rounded element that I love. Look at that. We did it. Giving it that more stability totally was what it needed. So we're gonna let that dry. So now we need to attach our little wonky little frame. <laughs> and I uh, wood glued and nailed that into place and that was good. Now we're gonna focus on the base and beef it up a little bit. And we are gonna take some plain wood right here and we are gonna add a routered edge. Can you see that? 
like a little decorative edge to this plain wood. I haven't used a router in, I don't know, like about 20 years and I figured it was about time. So we are going to route this. I'm not a routing pro, I have done it before. And since we're doing a straight cut, it's a little bit different than if you're doing like stuff on side, inside things um, or on the outside. Generally speaking, it's on the outside you go counterclockwise on the inside you go clockwise i believe <laughs> it might be reverse i don't know um but basically when you do this you need to feel like it you're pushing it against some pressure um if it's going smoothly then you're probably not doing it in the right direction so that's just like a little tidbit that i'm going to do so we're gonna um clamp this down put a decorative edge on it then we'll miter it and we'll wrap the base of this and then I've got some um, decorative pencil molding that we're going to do on the front face of this and then it's going to be priming and painting and then completion. <laughs> Then I cut them on a miter and we had to do it on like the tilt because of how tall it was. You can't just put it upright and miter it that way. You need to lay it down flat, tilt your miter saw and cut that on a 45 degree that way just because it's too tall the other way to do it. But we wanted a nice mitered edge and I glued and nailed those into place. And so then we had a nice decorative edge. Look at that. A little caulk and putty and we will be in business. Now, if you don't have a router and you wanna still build this um, clock, you could just take a decorative molding and put that on top of the flat one or leave it flat, whatever look you want. And then I noticed on a lot of clocks, they had a little bit of decorative molding that kind of like a little scroll. So we did that effect right underneath the clock and we are going to add some of these decorative elements in. So a little wood glue and some nails, put those into place. And then I took some of that same, I think it's like a pencil decorative molding. And I used my miter shears to clip that into place and glue and nail that in like a picture box manner on the front of the clock. And that kind of emulated, I guess, <laughs> the, where you usually have a glass pane. But in this case, we're not doing that because we're not actually building a grandfather clock, more of a faux grandfather clock. Okay, this next part is uber important in any DIY project, but particularly in this is puttying. You want to make sure you get every single hole filled with some putty and then let that dry. Then you sand everything down really, really good, wipe it down, and then you want to caulk any gaps and seams like on the mitered corners. If you feel like they're not tight enough, um, where our base hit our um, box, we needed to caulk in there anywhere that where there was any kind of seam go in and caulk those so they are nice and tight and then we let that dry once that was fully dried we could go into priming and so then I primed it um, really really well make sure everything is uh, covered and let that dry so this is an opportunity to go back in and sand a little bit more to make sure everything is really good before you add your actual paint and now we get to finally do the fun stuff so I covered up the clock face the best I could um, I taped it off really good and put something to cover it and then we added our paint and it's this is the same paint that I used on my hutch three coats of paint and caviar is the color and in it's in a cabinet enamel and this is really important this will help with durability and that was it all right how did I do on price I came in right at about $100, but I do think that I could have done it a little bit less if I had used a four by eight foot sheet of plywood. You may end up having to also tack on a little extra if you can't find a big clock face for $10, which was a huge steal on my part. So it, you could probably get this done for right at $100, depending on what you have in your wood pile, depending on what you have access to. I am thrilled. 
I absolutely love it. Is it exactly how I intended it? No, like the frame definitely juts out a little bit more than I wanted, but overall I'm just ecstatic and I learned so much in this. I learned about bending wood. I reintroduced myself to routing and I love it. It turned out so amazing. I am so proud of this. I hope it's something that stays in the family. I don't know, maybe I'll do a better version eventually down the road, but I love it. I'm so proud of it. My actual very favorite DIY of the year, and it's kind of a DIY in a sense, but I did have some help in completing it. And that is my drill that I developed. This is the Athena Lady Jane Power Drill. Ladies, can we just all agree that the tool aisle is just another boys club? Don't you think it's time we change that? I know I do. Men's drills are like shoulder pads from the 80s. Too big, too bulky and not sexy at all. I present to you the Lady Jane Drill by Athena Power Tools. Strong enough for a man, but made for a woman. Just look at her, her Tiffany-esque sparkling blue textured cheetah print handle, which feels just as good as it looks. No more sacrificing power for style. Ladies, we can have it all. Style and substance. 22,500 BPMs, and what that really means is a whole lot of power. She's got three different settings to conquer everything from drilling to screwing and masonry. Yes, even masonry. No more Barbie Dreamhouse tools for you. Now listen to the Athena drill. Worried about the weight? Don't be. She's barely over three pounds. Long lasting battery? Check. Quick charging? Double check. But wait, there's more. Lady Jane isn't riding solo. She comes with a whole entourage, a battery, a fast charging station, and a set of bits, all wrapped up in a water resistant cheetah print bag because your tools deserve a cute outfit too. Reign victorious over your DIY project. This is not just a tool, it's a statement. It says you're fierce, you're fabulous, and you can drill a hole in just about anything. Whether you're a 35 year old upcycling queen or a 65 year old grandma building a tree house for your grandchildren, the Lady Jane Drill is your new BFF. Our goal is to give you a Tiffany experience, but with power tools. So why settle for drills made by guys for guys? It's time to invest in a tool that's made for women by women. Click on the link below and order your Lady Jane drill today. I promise you are going to love it. It's time to unleash your inner DIY goddess and let's show the world what you are made of. Oh yeah. I spent so much time developing this. I had to really push back on the norms of what is expected and allowed in power tools and really help them see a different way of things because these are tools for women. And my goal is to do an entire line of female power tools. I want saws, I want nail guns, I want the whole line and you supporting this has meant the world to me. I really, really appreciate it. I really wanted to give women the feeling of getting something from Tiffany's when it comes to power tools. So it comes in this beautiful box that has a magnetic closure. I wanted you to be able to keep the box if you wanted to. It comes with this beautiful cheetah print bag with a raised logo and actual feet. And then of course the drill. It's awesome. <laughs> I love this. It's something that I am so proud of. I really kept you in mind when I was doing this. And so that's why it made my list. And so I hope you'll indulge me a little bit on it because it really is my very favorite DIY project of the year. Even though I had some help seeing it to fruition, every little ounce of this I designed and I'm so, excited to share it with you. So if you're interested in ordering it, we do have a few left. They're going to be shipping to our warehouse in January and hopefully we'll be able to start shipping them out late January, early February. And so I am so excited. I appreciate so much all of those of you who have already supported it and let Let's go out and DIY and start a whole new movement of power tools for women. Love it. <laughs> I hope you do too. So my next favorite project of this year was duping this super expensive ottoman that had this wood bridge over the top of it. The whole look was around $7,000 and I thought that was ridiculous. So let's take a look back on how I did it for 
about 10% of the cost. So the first thing we're gonna do is cut out the circles that will be the basis of our ottoman. I am gonna cut mine out to be 32 inches because that is the right size for the area that I'm working in. But you can use these same principles and build one to whatever size works for your area. So the very first thing I want to do is find center. And since this is square, it's a pretty easy task to do. We're gonna just take this um, piece of lumber that I've got here. You could use whatever you have on hand. And we're gonna go corner to corner and draw a line. And we're creating an X. And this will just help us find center. And then we're gonna switch and go corner to corner this way. So X marks the spot that is center for us. And what I'm gonna do is we're cutting a top and a bottom, and I want to do that at the same time just to make it a little easier for us. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a screw and screw that into center, and this is gonna help us draw our circle, but also attach the two boards together. And you wanna leave that poking out a little bit because we're gonna attach a string and that's how we're gonna go around. But to kind of hold it in place, I'm gonna just also put in a couple of extra screws that we'll remove later. This is just to hold this and keep it from spinning when we cut. And since this is not gonna be stained, you're not gonna see any of this, it doesn't really matter. That will just keep it from moving around. Since we're doing a 32 inch circle, we're gonna do 16 um, on all directions just to kind of give us a basis point, but then I'm going to show you a string technique, but this will just help us to know that we're on track and 16 inches from center because that adds up to 32. We'll do that in every direction. So we have like kind of an idea of where we're aiming for. We've got 16, 16, 16, but what we're going to do is we are going to take this string and tie a knot around this center thing and then we're going to make a slip knot as you can see that lines up and we'll just cut off the excess so this doesn't get in the way okay that's 16. we're gonna use this There we hit our 16. Okay, I'm gonna start from here. Okay, and then cut that off and we are ready to cut. Okay, now we're gonna take our jigsaw and we're gonna cut around the circle. Make sure you have a fresh blade on and here we go. We're gonna just back out these screws. That was not too hard. Look at that. Now we have two round pieces for our top and bottom of our ottoman. This is awesome. So I might keep this one for the bottom just because it has the markings that might help us with our feet. And then we'll use the other one as the top. Now we need to cut some studs to create the separation and the stability in between these two pieces. So we're gonna go to the miter saw now. Okay, so we need the height. And so what we're gonna do is I'm just gonna use some scrap lumber that I got out of my scrap pile. This is like a two by four, or you could use a two by three or whatever you want. And we're gonna cut eight of them to 15 and a half inch height, because by the time you add in like the feet, the plywood circles, the batting and all of that, the end height should be around 18 to 18 and a half inches so that's what we're going for so we're going to measure and this will end up being our pattern one so we'll get this one right we're going to measure 15 and a half <laughs> okay that's it here you can see that I've just evenly spaced these around the circle and what we're gonna do is attach the top and the bottoms to it. I'm gonna use a framing nailer just because it will work faster for me. It's very strong and I'm comfortable using that, but feel free to use a drill to screw them into place. Thank you. 
This is the masonite. I have a bunch of scrap masonite. We are going to wrap the outside of this just so it's a little bit more sturdy. So we're gonna cut some strips down to size on my table saw. You could use a circular saw as well, jigsaw, whatever you've got handy to you. And then we are going to take our nail gun and tack it into place. I just nailed that into place and then I took some screws and also reinforced that just because it's bendable and it's very bendy but it wants to straighten back out so the screws will just ensure that it stays in place and there you have it. Now we have the frame but I wanted to have some feet and I didn't want the decorative feet to be very tall because of all of our inspiration photos of the ottoman the feet were very low profile what I decided to do is just take some scrap one by fours that I had and I cut them down to six inches in length and then I set them underneath our uh, ottoman on the curve and I traced the curve out because I wanted them to follow the pattern of the curved and not to be square and this is just a little detail that I think will really elevate our piece in the end. So then I just, I actually just screwed that into this table. This, this table's <laughs> been through a lot, so an extra hole is not going to kill it at this point. So I just actually screwed those into place while I cut out the roundedness with my jigsaw. And then I sanded them up really quick to soften the edges, and then I stained them. And then once they were dry, I added a clear coat of poly. And I didn't do any stain on the top and the bottom just because I knew it was gonna be sitting on the carpet. And when I use gel stain, I just worry about it like taking forever to dry. So that's why I did it that way. Then I took a one inch foam and I cut that out to fit the top of the ottoman and just used some industrial scissors that I picked up at the Home Depot a while back and it fit really good on top of there. I did a little bit of spray adhesive to kind of hold it into place and then set that on top. Then I took some leftover batting that I had from other projects. In fact, I had to kind of piecemeal it together a little bit over the top. It was fine. And then I stapled that over the top of our foam. And then I cut off any excess so it was nice and round. And then I did the same thing with the batting on the sides just so there was a little softness to the sides as well. And then it was ready to upholster. So then I stapled that over the top of our foam and then I used a sewing machine for the rest of it. Now you, there are ways to do this without a sewing machine. I just feel like this gives me a little bit more polished look and it's something that I'm comfortable doing. So I cut out the side panels and then I pinned it around the side to make sure it was nice and fitted and then I put the, some clasps on it and then I sewed that together in like a circle fashion. Then I know in some of the inspiration photos that I showed of the ottoman that we were gonna do, there wasn't really piping on it, but I just feel like a little bit of piping gives it a very nice finished and polished look. So I went ahead and created a little piping. It's very simple to do, just stitch, 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 stitch. And then once you have your piping ready to go, I sewed it to the top of our side panel uh, fabric. Then we were ready to attach it to our ottoman. Now I wanted it to be super even, so what I did is I lined it up. You kind of do it inside out and upside down, if that makes sense. And I took some, um, this, you can order it, upholstery cardboard, and it's just kind of like a long roll. And then you can staple it into place all the way around. And what that does is it keeps a nice even seam. So you, if you're putting staples like in different spots, it doesn't really matter because the cardboard kind of holds the shape of it and gives it a nice and polished look. So then we stapled that all the way around the top and then you can pull it back down very carefully over the bottom. And this was the moment of truth. It fit perfectly. I was super excited. Then what you're gonna do is flip your ottoman over and staple on the bottom. Just make sure that you don't over pull. There was a couple of areas I felt like I, I may have pulled the fabric a little bit too tight. You want it firm, but not like so f firm that it's like pulling funny on like the foam. So <laughs> super helpful, right? <laughs> very big. Oh dear. This next part is totally optional, but I felt like it gave it a more professional finished look. So on the bottom, I got some of that black upholstery felt that you see on a lot of bottoms of um, upholstered items. And I stapled that into place 
in a circular fashion. I do, I felt like it gave it more of like an official piece of furniture, even though nobody's really gonna see the bottom of the ottoman, let's be honest. Nobody's gonna be flipping over your ottoman to make sure you have that black felt. So totally optional. So then I took my DIY feet that you honestly, in the end, will be surprised. They don't look like DIY, they're, they're awesome. So, and then I just screwed them into our bottom circle and I, I mean, I didn't like measure it out or anything. I just put two to four screws in each foot and made sure that they were countersunk in. You want them in deep because you don't want those scratching and catching on things. So make sure that those screws are in there nice and tight. Then our ottoman is done. Awesome, it looks so good at this point. Now it's time to do that infamous, very expensive bridge. Now, just as a caveat, we are using pine. The inspiration wood, I believe, was an O, but we're gonna give this a try, see how it works out. So the first thing we're gonna do is we are gonna cut two sides that were about 18 and a half inches tall. You're gonna wanna make sure to measure this with the ottoman that you have, just to double check. And I brought it inside, measured it, and then I put the two sides on and measured our topper on the ottoman just because I didn't want to have any like miscalculations. I just thought it would be easy to visualize it this way and mark it and it works great for me. So then we just cut off our top. So for this next part, the method that we're going to be using is wood dowels. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to take some nails and tap them in the middle of our two by four like so. We're gonna do like four of them. And we're not hammering them in all the way, you'll notice. This is a little hack I like to do. Okay, so we've got four in there. So then we're gonna just take some wire cutters and clip off the tip of our nails. So now they're sharp. And the reason this is important is because of this. I'm gonna show you. And then you're gonna line it up with where you're gonna, your other piece of lumber and make sure it's all square. And then you're gonna take a hammer and kind of tap it into place and it will make a hole on the corresponding piece. Okay, so you can see, I don't know if you can see it, but I can see it. There's little divots where we should make our hole for our dowels. So then you just pull out the nails drill the holes, and then you've got your holes for your wood dowels. And then you're gonna fill those holes with wood glue and a little extra on top, wood glue, definite must on this. And then you're going to attach it to the top and you're gonna do this on both sides. So you're gonna just attach them and they should line up really well if you follow that little hack and there will be no worries there. So I took another piece of wood and kind of really hammered that into place. It was nice and tight, which is what you want. It's probably a good idea to clamp it. I didn't this time. What I did do instead is on the underside of our, I call it a wood bridge, I added a couple of metal brackets on just to reinforce it. And that was it for like the construction portion. Then I took my sander and sanded it all down. Try to smooth it out a little bit. Maybe some of the sharp corners I sanded down a little bit. And then I used a stain and poly in one and in an espresso finish on this one and let that fully dry. Ours is not rounded. <laughs> the inspiration one is rounded and that takes a certain level of skill and craftsmanship, but to be honest with you, I love how this turned out. I think it adds, it has a very similar look for a fraction of the cost. The piece of lumber I think was about 10 or $11. We had some leftover, whatever. And then I had some, I used a little tiny bit of stain. So I'm gonna call this $12. 
certainly the high-end one is lovely. I'm not knocking the craftsmanship of it all. It's beautiful. I just would never spend that kind of money and I'm perfectly happy with my $12 one. Okay, so my next favorite DIY was actually a DIY Ikea hack on a dresser that I had in my son's room already. We gave it a whole new sleek and modern look, which is a little bit out of my wheelhouse if you've been watching my channel before, but I really love the overall end look of it. So let's take a look back at that one. On these Hemnes dressers, I've always felt like the, the top piece sticks out a little too far on either end and it just looks off. <laughs> and so what I decided to do was trim off about an inch on either side to make it look a little bit more proportional, if you will. And so I took some painter's tape and taped it down and used that as a guide to cut off the excess on the edges. Now, if you have a circular saw, it would probably work a little bit easier. It would keep you a little straighter. I used a jigsaw because it was quick and easy. I grabbed it, didn't think much about it. And so I did have to go back in and kind of sand down some unevenness, but in the end it, it did turn out, it looks good, it's fine. So use whatever saw you have on hand. Unfortunately, when I kind of cut, it chipped up some of the wood, which I, in theory shouldn't have happened because I had taped it down. I don't know if my saw was just not, my blade was not sharp enough or what, um, but it, it's no matter. I kind of just cleaned it up a little bit and sanded it down. And then I added some wood putty to that and we let that dry while we moved on to the front of the dresser. So the first thing I did is I removed the hardware and then I had it in my mind to do kind of um, this, wood trim effect on the dresser because I'm going to be taking this bedroom slightly more modern than maybe the rest of my house. It's because it's for my son and it's I want it to be a little bit more masculine. What we're gonna do is we are gonna take these, I believe they're a 3 8 inch square dowel and we are gonna do an asymmetrical design on our drawer fronts. We don't need a saw for this. We're gonna just use these miter shears. They're, it's gonna come in super handy. And then we'll be using some tiny tiny little pin nails that are about 5 8 inch thick which will be thick enough to go through our wood dowel and then go into the dresser. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to clip off some and what I was thinking is on an angle this way from here to here and then we'll do some vertical ones going on the bottom. So hopefully it will all work out. So the first thing I'm going to do is cut it on an angle that like a 45 degree angle and this is just like having a little mini saw it's awesome so we'll just cut the tip off of this just ever so slightly and then what we can do is i'm gonna have get a pencil and we're gonna make our marks So that's our first one. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna skip obviously where that is and just continue it on down over here. So that's what we're trying to do here. And we'll keep going. I evenly spaced it out using um, just a piece of scrap wood just to make sure that each space was even and not uneven. I started from the top left-hand corner and kind of moved off to the right until we had our angles finished. Okay, so in my initial plan, I just thought I would put this here so it was more continuous. But looking at it on a whole, I think that that looks too busy or like I'm trying to fix a mistake and that looks a little more intentional. So I think we're gonna remove that and just have it have a line through it. And then I wanted to run some vertical pieces meeting up into our angled pieces. <laughs> so math, it gets my mind all nervous. <laughs> just kidding. And 
then I just made sure I filled all of the nail holes and made sure after everything was dry, I did a good sanding on top. I sanded um, the dresser, I sanded off all of our putty marks and it was ready for paint. Now, if you ever see me use black paint on furniture, on walls, on drawers, anything that is not chalk paint that I had to have mixed, the color is most likely Sherwin-Williams Caviar. It's a beautiful black color that has a little bit of warmth on the undertones, it's not cool, it's like on the warmer end of things. And I just love it, I think it's a beautiful color of black. And that's what I ended up using on this dresser. It was so funny to me because the Hemnes dresser is considered a black brown and this color was almost a color match to it. So the only place you need to really be careful is probably on the dowels because it was so close to the actual color of the original dresser that um, I don't think you're gonna need many coats, if that makes sense. And then let that dry, it was looking good. I was so excited. And I had actually a different idea for the drawer handle. I was gonna do like a long bar across it, but I figured we already had so much going on with the angles of the dresser that adding a long bar um, handle would have been a little bit too busy in my opinion. And so what I decided to do is I ordered some edge pole handles to put on the top of the dresser and we attached those and they were in the brass color it was the perfect finishing touch and it just turned out gorgeous i love the way this turned out i am super super excited my son got a sneak peek of it he loves it he's super excited with the direction i am taking the room and i i just love it i think it it all it was was $10 worth of wood dowels, a little bit of elbow grease and some paint. And we have totally transformed the look of this Hemnes dresser into something very custom looking. And I just love that. Simple changes equal great results. All right, so for the next DIY is I had kind of a brainchild of how to hack a shaker cabinet door. I love the idea of building my own cabinet doors or refacing my cabinets, but all of the tutorials that I found out there were really complicated so in my mind I came up with several hacks and kind of combined them all together to come up with a very convincing new cabinet door. It got a lot of views and I think a lot of you have tried it out. It is awesome. For 2024 though, I may want to kind of experiment on a way to make a, a traditional style shaker door in the traditional way but in a way that hopefully you and I can understand. I feel like the tutorials out there are a little bit complex. But in the meantime, let's take a look back at how I did this one. The first thing is, you know, it's got inexpensive hardware and in and of the, itself, that is not like a huge problem. But really what it is, is this partial overlay, okay? For something to look really high end and custom, most often they are doing a full overlay cabinet. And what that means really is that you don't see the face framing that much. If you do, it's just the tiniest little bit. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna build some new cabinet doors. So I came up with a hack that I don't think anybody else is doing. I'm just gonna throw it out there. It's my own brainchild. If somebody else has done it, I have not personally seen it. As far as I know, I'm the only one doing this way. I don't even know if it's gonna work. <laughs> I'm hoping it does. But what we're gonna do to address this is we're gonna do a full overlay, like I said, uh, where we're gonna cover up all of the gaps or as much of it as we can. We're gonna make the drawer a little bit bigger. And then we might add some, a little bit of decorative trim on the inside that I'm still kind of debating on, we'll see. And then we're gonna paint this all out so it looks super high end, super custom, maybe some feet. So let me show you how we're gonna do. The first thing we're gonna do is you need to open up the cabinets. <laughs> I've still got my stuff in there. Not super organized, but it's, it's seen worse. <laughs> and we are gonna take these off the hinges so we can take some measurements. Okay, I needed to jump in here really quick and offer a trigger warning to those of you who may be watching that are actual 
carpenters. Yes, there is a proper way to build a cabinet. And then there's also additional ways. Now, I haven't ever seen the method that I'm going to be using today done before, but you can't argue with the results. Turned out amazing. I cannot wait to share it with the rest of you who are like me and want an easier way to make custom looking cabinets. And that's what we're gonna do right now. Okay, so maybe we can hang on to these for uh, another project or something, I don't know. If you already have a full overlay cabinet and you're just looking for an updated door, then just measure the dimensions of this cabinet. For me, it's not gonna be helpful. So I'm gonna show you how I'm gonna go about measuring it. And as a little side note, unfortunately, we are not gonna be able to reuse these hinges because we are doing a full overlay. We need to use different hinges. So hang on to them for something else, I guess. <laughs> as for these fake drawers, in theory, I think they're supposed to be able to push right out. So, yep. Hopefully we don't break them. Maybe we can reuse the snaps. So those just should snap right off. This certainly feels like it could turn into something too, but I'm supposed to be purging. <laughs> oh dear. When you have a creative brain, everything is like a treasure. So. <laughs> those are permanently attached on, so I don't know if we'll reuse those or not. We might just nail them right in. Okay, so this is what we are left with. And I'm just actually gonna leave everything in place because I think we can do this carefully without making a crazy mess. So there's several tutorials out there that kind of show you how to come about to your dimensions. Those don't really work for me. The primary reason is this piece right here is a little bit thicker than normal, I think, for a centerpiece. And so the idea is, is that you leave like an eighth of an inch gap in between the two boards and an eighth of an inch gap here. And you just try to take up as much space as possible. We'll probably bring it out to here, but leave like an eighth of an inch gap here. So basically it's like the cabinet doors need to cover pretty much everything. Now we are going to have a little bit of excess on both sides and that's just because those are filler strips and the hinges won't accommodate it to go much more. So you're going to measure basically your opening. In my case, um, I, I'm overlapping a little bit. Usually I think it's adding about two and a half inches to every open space. I think I'm ending up having to add a slight bit more because the center strip is so big. So it's essentially about two and a half and two and a half this way but these were a little bit shorter. So I had to do custom dimensions. I've got my dimensions figured out. We are gonna go start our awesome little hack now. Okay, so we've been kind of fighting against some weather. I've <laughs> been trying to do this project for days now. So we're gonna do it here, only to keep my camera equipment under cover, just in case it starts raining. I don't like doing it this way, but I think it will be okay. And I don't know if I mentioned it yet or not, we are using one quarter inch plywood for this project, and you'll see what we're doing as we go. <laughs> it's pretty creative, we'll say. Now that we have our measurements, we are going to cut down this sheet of plywood into more manageable sizes. And we're gonna lift that up on styrofoam just so that we can be able to use our clamp and to have some support underneath it so our blade doesn't like cut into the ground. Okay, so this is why I actually like using my table saw because the table saw has more teeth on it and this is why that matters, I'll show you. See how there's not very many teeth on there and that's what happens when you have like bigger chunks of teeth. It it rips up the wood a little bit more. So what I think I'm gonna do is I will cut this next one to like 25 inches and then I will shave off a little bit on each side so that it will be smoother. I think we can make the first one work, cut it perfectly. <laughs> I just need a, like many more teeth on my um, circular saw if I want a smoother cut. So we're gonna make this work. 
Once I got these pieces down to a more manageable sizes, I finished it up on my table saw. It gives a little bit more pristine cut and a huge four by eight foot sheet would be difficult for one person to do. And then after I cut down our cabinet door fronts, I cut down two and three quarter inch strips for the rails and the styles out of the same sheet, which by the way, we didn't even use the whole sheet. Okay, so up to this point, you might be going, what in the heck is this crazy girl doing? You probably don't understand what direction I'm going in, but hopefully this will all come together right now. So rather than measure, I think this will be a little bit more accurate if we line up edge to edge here, and then we can, that's our cut mark right there, see? So we can cut this and then this will be our pattern and we can do a total of four of these per door and you'll see what we're doing. Okay, so another option that you could go with is this two and a half inch wide, one quarter inch thick project wood. This is a little bit more expensive option, but it gives you a really nice finished look and it saves you one of the steps. So maybe consider this as well. Okay, I'm gonna interject this now because you're gonna see me assembling these cabinets and I did it differently. I would just highly recommend, and this is gonna seem so obvious, running these slats with the long grain of the wood, you will get far less splintering on it when you do it this way. It just is much, much nicer, but you'll see in some of the ones that I did, I cut it against the grain. So you line up the edge of the blade with the edge of the line. You don't center it because otherwise it will be too short and then cut. Now we are going to assemble our doors. We are gonna first add our first style on the edge, which are the ones that run vertical, I believe. And then we're gonna use a generous amount of glue to attach all of these pieces. And then we're gonna add our rails, which is the ones that run horizontal. And then we're gonna snug those right up against that first style. And then we're gonna finish it off with our final style. And then we're gonna temporarily clamp the pieces down in place so that we can flip it over and repeat that entire process on the other side. Now this process will replicate the look and the thickness of a traditional shaker cabinet without the need of the additional equipment or skill. Cool, right? So we could leave it like this, a traditional shaker cabinet. Um, we are gonna address the sides here. I'm not gonna leave them ugly. While this is drying though, I figured we could go ahead and do our trim and I'm just gonna use a miter shear for this. All you do is, this is just basically like scissors for trim. And we're gonna put it on a 45 degree angle. And we are going to cut the end here. It cuts so easy, okay? So then what we're gonna do is just line that up here. And then we are going to make our mark of our miter that we need. Then we're gonna take our miter shears, line that up. That's so easy. Okay, now we're gonna just glue this all down. Look how gorgeous this is. I am so glad we added that little bit of detail. And of course we still have the clamps on, so we'll let this fully dry and then we'll do the next one. Okay. <laughs> we have let this dry overnight and I am super excited with how it's looking so far. It's definitely dry enough that we can start removing off all of the tape, but I wanted to show you this. 
finished. From here, it looks really good. This looks like a, an awesome custom cabinet. We do have some like a little bit of minor filling that we need to do and all of that. But on this edge, can you see that? This looks DIY. This does not look like a, a custom cabinet, but I do have a solution for that. And we are going to take care of that now. We are going to wrap the edges in edge banding. Okay, so this is where it's going to finish it off really nice. And I'm really excited about that. I've seen all of these ideas like separately, but I've never seen anybody build it this way. And maybe that's for a good reason. I don't know. So far, I'm thinking it's turning out fantastic. But before we edge band, there are a couple of little areas that are a little bit uneven. So I'm going to take my sander, sand off the edges. Next time around, I will probably use this hack again and I have learned a few things. I might actually bank in um, about an inch on every side or a half an inch on every side so that when I get to this point, I could just run it through my table saw and get a really nice clean edge all the way around. So we are gonna sand it for this time and then we'll put on the edge banding, then we'll fill in all of the gaps and all of that, put on the hinges, test it out before we paint it. So let's get going with removing the tape and sanding. Okay, so we're doing this inside because I need to use my iron, but we are going to cover up this unfinished kind of ugly. It's a lot better now that we sanded it. I got a huge roll of edge banding off of Amazon and I'm just gonna cut off a piece. I'm using some industrial scissors. We're gonna cut off a piece that's a little bit longer and then we're gonna line up the front of ours with the front of this so any excess will be scraped off of the back. And then while the glue's hot, you can kind of wiggle it around too, but this goes on very easily. This is an iron that I kind of dedicated to craft projects, so if it gets any glue on it, it's okay. If you don't have one dedicated to crafts, I would maybe use a little piece of parchment paper in between, but just go back and forth. And you wanna make sure this is on dry setting. Then I just kind of look and make sure it's placed good. And while that's cooling, we're gonna do the bottom. Make sure everything is lined up. So can you see how we have a little excess? And that's what we're gonna take care of right now. Then they make these handy little tools here. So it just comes apart here and then it moves. We're gonna very carefully line this up and gently squeeze. Are you kidding me right now? This looks amazing. Looks, look from the back to the front, it looks like a custom built door. You can't see any ugly mechanics or anything. So we are gonna fill in a couple of the gaps and get that all prepped and ready for paint. But first we're gonna do our full overlay hinges. This will be a hidden hinge so you don't see them, but you can do any kind of hinges you want. Um, this just gives a lot cleaner look and, and it's a really good way to do your overlay. And so I have another Craig jig for this process to hopefully make it super simple. Okay, so I'm gonna show you just how easy it is to put these hinges on the back of the door using this little handy Craig jig. All the hinges are gonna have different measurements. Mine says to put it on at three and a half inches in. So there's a handy guide here that shows you right where that is. That's three and a half inches, cause it's four inches. And then all we do is clamp this into place. You can use clamps that come with it or whatever clamps you have. And we're gonna make sure that's on there good and tight. And then it comes with this bit and this is what routes out the little cup for the hinges and we're gonna just take this part and lock it into place and then it acts kind of like a drill press and it won't move around. Okay, so then we push that down twist this and see how that locks it into place and that that's going to hold it into place and so then we just take our drill and drill in and then we can unlock it 
And you can see it drilled out quite a lot really quickly. And so I'm just gonna take my shop vac and vacuum that up. Okay, and you you might be wondering why I didn't just take that off and I'll show you why. Because we gotta take this off and you take a tiny little bit, put that into your drill. See, so we've got a tiny little bit and you can see there's a couple of little holes right here and that is to pre-drill for the screws for the hinges. So that's got it ready to go. And since we've already got this already on the little tiny bit, we're gonna pre-drill those parts first. Okay, and then we'll take that off, set that aside, and we'll put this bit back on and do the other hinge. Okay, then we just take off the hinges. And that literally took no time at all. And we've got our holes for our cup hinges. So that is ready to go. All right, we're almost getting to the good part. So we are gonna just fill in some of these little cracks here using this spackling. I like this because it's really smooth and it dries quickly. Now we're gonna just sand it with some nice 220 grit sandpaper. I'm gonna get in the corners first and then I'll take an electric sander to it. Now it was time to prime and paint. I primed it in a kills primer. You want to make sure that the wood is ready for paint. Let that fully dry. And then we did two coats of cargo pants, which is what I went with on the back and then flipped it over and did two coats on the front. And while that was drying, I came in here and primed and painted the face framing that was on the cabinetry because it will still peek through. So once it was all primed and painted, it was time to hang our doors and then also our little fake drawer front, which I had just cut down using some scrap wood that I actually had on hand. And the dimensions of your drawer will obviously depend on your projects. And so so then I attached the cup hinges onto the back and then I did pre-drill holes for them and I aligned them with the bottom of the vanity and then screwed them in. And then what I decided to do to attach these drawers is actually just nail it into place. Cause honestly, I've lived here for five years. I've never popped off these drawer fronts once until we decided to paint this. And then I just did a little putty on the nail holes and let that dry, wiped it down and did some touch up paint. So that is how I did my drawer fronts. And I love it. I'm gonna be honest with you. I really am glad I did this project. I cannot believe how these door fronts turned out. I am extremely proud of the way these turned out. Love it. And I hope that it helps some of you who want to save a ton of money refacing your cabinets. So one of my favorite thrift flips of the year was some old like glass covers that you would see on like a ceiling pan or something like that, maybe a bathroom vanity light, they kind of bell out. When I looked at them, I saw a bell, and so that's what we did. I started out with some bathroom shades and they needed a little cleanup. So I just took a Phillips head screwdriver and kind of try to flick out that gasket that's on the top. And I was able to get most of that off and scrape that off really good. And then before I cleaned it, I took the sticker off and then th there was like a little bit of residue on it. So I ran an alcohol pad over the entire thing to clean it and that evaporates very quickly. Now it's prepped for paint and I sprayed the inside of it with this gold gold spray paint and it's just called gold and it's more of like an antique color and I did that really good let that dry and then I flipped it back over and sprayed the outside really good and then what I did is while I was out there spray painting everything I decided to take these candle cup 
holders that you can get at the craft store. And I took my drill and I took a Forstner bit. I think it was a one half inch Forstner bit and drilled a hole in three of them. While we were out there already, I spray painted the inside and the outside of those for a step that's coming in just a second. Once that was dry, I took it inside to my craft table and I had several different shades of rub and buff. But before I added the rub and buff, I wanted to hit a little bit of random spots with some black acrylic paint. And I took, had a baby wipe to kind of just blend it in and rub it in. What we're going for is an aged bell. If you haven't figured that out, we're trying to make like an antique looking bell. And so I went in with the black first to kind of give it like that aged, dirty brass look. Use whatever you have on hand. I think I used cotton pads this time around, but you can use paper towel. You can use whatever you have. You can use your finger, but I don't recommend it. It stays on there very good. <laughs> I just was doing a random pattern, kind of mixing all the different kinds of golds. The one that was most dominant is the European gold, and I will use that a few times in this episode. It has the most brass-like finish, in my opinion. So once I got it looking how I wanted, I went back in with some more of the black paint and kind of put that on and then washed it all over and kind of swirled it so it just looked aged and kind of dirty. It's looking pretty good at this point. I'm super excited with the direction. Now I want to put like a wooden handle on it, but the finial that I bought at Hobby Lobby was a little bit too small at the base to go on top of the opening and it, it wouldn't have sat on there right. I didn't want to make another trip to the store, so I decided to just use my Cricut maker. I made nine total of two inch discs, wood discs, and then I was gonna do three of them stacked with some wood glue. And that's what I was gonna use to cover up that spot, but it would be very, very simple to just go get a two inch wood circle. They have them in the craft section. I just didn't wanna make a trip. I had the things that I needed to make it, and so that's what I did. But you don't need a Cricut maker to do this, so <laughs> I just wanted to clarify that. So so I glued three of them together and of course I made three because I was making three bells. Once those were dry, I glued the finials onto the wood circle and let those completely dry. And now it is time to take antiquing glaze and that's what I used to antique the wood handles to look old and aged and it worked out really good. I let that dry. So now we need to put everything together. So I wanted it to make sure it was sturdy because this is a glass piece. This is not actual brass. We made it look like brass, but this is glass and it could break. So I wanted to make sure that our wood handle stayed on there very good. So I took an epoxy kit that I get at the Dollar Tree, mixed that little bit together and epoxied our little wood finial toppers onto each one of our little brass bells. Next up, it wouldn't be a bell without the little chime. So I took our spray painted little candle cups and I went and did the same treatment that I did pretty much for the most part on the big bell, but I just basically concentrated on the European gold and the little bit of black glazing that I was doing and let that dry. And then what I did is I took a piece of rope and I made a knot and threaded that through. Then I made it to a certain length so it would poke out a little bit and then I hot glued that into the center of the bell. And we are almost done because all I needed to do next was wrap some twine around the top part of the handle, do a square knot, and then I had the excess to hang it with. But I left one alone because as you can see over here, these are the adorable bells. Aren't they amazing? But I decided to only do two. I'm gonna keep one of them for sure. And maybe I'll keep these ones too. Um, to, I'm gonna use this one in my everyday decor because I love it so much. But what is really cool Cool. is it actually functions like a bell because it's got the glass and the, the little cup rings i love this i think it's so so beautiful it looks like an antique bell i am thrilled beyond belief how these turned out. I think it looks so cute with my swagged fireplace mantle. I might add more to it. I just staged it like this for this episode, but I think it's so pretty. You can see a little bit of the little chime hanging out. 
Doesn't it look authentic? It looks like I thrifted it and I found it like that in the antique store, but only you and I know all the little steps that we did to do that, but none of them were very difficult at all. This is a totally easy first time project and you can get a wow result like this. So one of my favorite DIY projects from Wood is I created a bathroom tray that went over my bathtub and it was so simple to put together but it looked good. It's gotten a lot of use. So I hope that this is a project that you might want to take on in the next year. Measure the width of your bathtub area. So for me, mine was 48 inches. And so I just cut down a piece of wood 12 inches deep to 48 inches. And then I found some scrap pieces of one by two in my stash and I cut those down to fit the depth of our bathroom tray that we are making. This is so super easy, I promise you. So then I took a little bit of wood glue and some finished nails and I nailed it from the underside. Now you don't need the nail gun for this. You could just do a hammer and nails, super easy, easy. And then once that was dried, I just made sure everything was sanded down really good, that there was no sharp corners on the edges. And then I proceeded to stain the underside first and then let that dry and then I flipped it over because the underside needed some level of protection, but really all you're gonna really be noticing is the top part. And so that's where I really paid a lot of attention. I did two coats of the stain and poly in one and let that fully dry for a couple of hours. And that couple of hours turned into a couple of days <laughs> before I finally got around to adding the handles. I picked up these handles on clearance at Hobby Lobby. I think they were $3.50 a piece, making this bathroom tray super, super affordable. And then I just screwed that onto the top part um, using just some drywall screws. And I feel like those match up with this iron really, really well. This would make such an amazing gift. So put that in your back pocket and save it for future use because it's so nice to have because you can just sit back, watch a movie on a tablet, read a book, burn a candle, just really relax, maybe meditate. I really love having this tray. I think it elevates the look of my bathroom. It's beautiful and functional and it was really easy to make. This year I also took a grandfather clock, like a wall one, not a huge one, and I converted it from a grandfather clock. It was not antique, it wasn't even vintage, so for those of you who haven't seen this yet, don't freak out because this is something that was completely newer and I decided to flip it into a spice cabinet and I really love the end result. The first thing I did was knock out with a hammer the back of this clock and get get rid of the clock. What I will tell you is this was not an antique. There was nothing vintage or special about it. In my opinion, I really liked the shape. I actually thought it was oak. But what I came to find out when I knocked out the back is that it was all pressed wood with like a thin paper veneer over the top. So this wasn't even a real wood. I was like, oh my goodness. Now I definitely don't feel bad for doing this because I was thinking that it was actually at least, oh, not the case. It was pressed wood with like some kind of uh, like a particle board. So I had actually purchased an oak piece of wood to use as some shelves that we're gonna now put into this, what we're gonna turn into a cabinet. And I didn't even need to fork over the money for the oak because it wasn't even oak to begin with. So there you go. My initial plan was to actually do some pocket holes and attach that to our cabinet that way. It didn't end up working out. It was a little too tight of quarters for that to work. It didn't matter because for what we are going to be using it for my backup plan is going to be just fine and that is we are going to turn it into a spice cabinet so what i did is i just cut down three shelves and i ended up adding plenty of wood glue and nailing them from the outsides to hold it into place so we got that attached and then what we needed to do is cut out a new backer piece to put on the back we're not going to attach it yet we're just cutting it out while we're making all of our other cuts and then i went ahead and did some putty 
on those nail holds on the side and it was ready to go. I taped off the glass. I didn't want to get primer all over it. Even though you can kind of scrape it off, I would have probably been fine. I just went ahead and taped off all of the glass to cover that up. Then I sprayed it with a white primer, let that fully dry, and then I went about painting the black. But what my goal was is to kind of emulate my china hutch and do a white interior and a black exterior because I've kind of got that theme going on in my house now with my grandfather clock, my china hutch. I kind of wanted to repeat that theme on a small scale. So I ended up doing three coats of black on the outside and two coats of white on the inside. And I was really happy with it, but then we needed to put on our back with a nail gun and that was really all set to go. Then we reattached our cabinet door and it looked great. I was super thrilled with how this turned out. Put all of my spices in there, a cute little succulent from I think the Dollar Tree. And this turned out so good. I'm so thrilled with how it all turned out. It looks beautiful upscale, high end. Next up, I got another thrifted thing. And initially I thought it might be some kind of a candle stand, but it was kind of not like, it didn't look exactly like a candle stand, but it had a lot of the elements of candle stand and I converted it into an end table. Let's take a look back and see how I did that. So the first thing that I did is I sanded down some of the raised texturing on this piece because it had been hand painted with roses and everything. And maybe you thought it was beautiful like that. It is in its own right. It's just not my style. And we were trying to reimagine it. And we also wanted to give it kind of like a rougher texture for it to adhere to. And then once I sanded it down, I wiped it down really well with a wet cloth and let it dry. And then because it had a floral thing, I felt like it needed some sort of primer or an undercoat. So I proceeded to spray paint it in a grayish color and let that dry. And then I did two coats of a flat white spray paint. You could use any kind of regular paint, hand paint it if you'd like. I just like this for ease and getting in those little nooks and crannies. It was a hot day and so it dried very quickly and I was able to put on a couple of coats of white paint. At this point, I distressed it a little bit and then it was time to put on the tabletop. I took a piece of scrap wood and I just really wanted to make sure it was level, it was evenly spaced and so I made an X mark and that really helps you to find center and I did it on both sides to kind of give me like some guide references and we're not really even gonna see this piece and so I used a little bit of wood glue and then I took a nail gun and shot in some two inch nails into the top base so that it was nice and sturdy and then I let that dry and then I went back in and I got this decorative round at Hobby Lobby what's really cool about it is it does have a lip so that it makes it look like it's an inch thick I believe but the actual solid piece of wood or like the big part of the wood is only a quarter of an inch thick that's a reason why I did that base under piece to give it a little bit more strength and integrity but also to lift it up a little bit and then I added glue to the top of that and put in four or five nails in the top of that. And then I took some wood filler, filled those in, let it dry, and then went back in and sand it. I did a wood conditioner because I have learned in the past that when you don't wood condition on a transparent stain, it makes it splotchy. If you're using a gel stain, it's way more forgiving just because it's way more like a dense color. But I was using more of a transparent um, stain. And so conditioning the wood is a really important step if that's what you're doing. So I did the wood conditioner, let it dry. And then I came in with a whitewash over the top. Now this could have really worked if I had like a darker wood to begin with, but I was using, I think it's like a birch or something very light colored and it just fell kind of flat. It didn't look very good in the room. I didn't like it. I even sealed it and everything. And so then I just didn't like it. Then I took it out and I was like, well, I'll just do this stain and poly in one in a pecan finish. And it went over it, but because I had already sealed it, it didn't really saturate the wood very well. I was like, 
Oh gosh, I don't really feel like sanding it all down. So all I did is I took some antique glaze and did a couple of coats in the antiquing glaze over the top of it. It worked out really good. But going back, I think I would have gone more drastic and a little bit more high contrast from the outset. And then I think that I would have really, really been happy with the final look. In the end, it looks really pretty good. Maybe one day I will sand down that top and do a darker finish. But for now, I'm really happy with the way it looked. I think that this little finial thing cost me, it was like $6.99 or something. The topper was about $10. So some paint and supplies, easily under $20. We have a really cute, high-end looking end table. And you would have never known that this was like a country kind of floral looking sculpture before. You would have always thought that this was an end table. I love this project. I love it so much. I think it turned out really, really good. If you've been watching my channel for a while, you know that I love things to do with fireplaces. I built two and this last year I created an over mantle for my DIY rental friendly one and I ended up building that in. So that's actually gonna stay here. And you know I've got some more fireplace projects planned for the new house. One for sure, maybe two, and then maybe a total overhaul of the existing fireplace. If you haven't seen my new forever home, make sure you check that video out. I'll link it below. So I had some two by four lumber in my scrap pile already. I'm really chipping away at the scraps. I'm really getting down to the end and I think I'll have enough for this and so I'm really excited. Okay so we're gonna do the base and top plates is what I'm gonna call them like the top one and bottom one and that measurement should be 48 inches exactly. Okay and to make sure this is all even We'll use this as a pattern and we don't need to because they are exact. So that's perfect. Okay, then we need to measure the thickness of this because we need to get rid of that in our calculations. And that's one and a half inches. So we're gonna have two of those. So three inches we need to take off of the 47 and a half of the height. And so that's 44 and a half. So we need to cut three of those. Okay, so I am gonna be using a framing nailer simply because I have it. If you do not have a framing nailer, just use a drill and some really long wood screws and screw it into place. This will make quick work of it. It's very strong. This seems intimidating to a lot of people, but to me, I love it. <laughs> and I feel so powerful when I use it and, and it works well and quickly. Just make sure you're wearing safety glasses. Make sure you're very careful as I always try to be. So we're gonna nail in both side pieces and then the middle piece and then we'll put on the top plate. So it's like base, one, two, three, and then top plate, very simple framing, super easy. We got this. So the first thing I want to do is find center, which would be right there because then we'll know that when we hang a mirror or something piece of art or whatever in the middle there will be something to screw it into first we are going to line this up make sure it's nice and square hold it nice and flat nice put that in the center all right So this is our frame. I ended up putting at least two nails in each point so it would be nice and sturdy. So I've got this sheet left over from my son's um, bedroom makeover and it's not quite a full sheet. A full sheet would have actually been perfect for what we're doing. So what I'm gonna have to do is cut this in half and then like still like a little section um, from the extra and piece it together and hope that it looks good. I think it'll be fine, but we're gonna try to make this work.
Okay, this is turning out almost perfect. Like, it's spaced evenly from top and bottom. And so we've just got this one seam here towards the bottom. Once we caulk it, you won't even notice it. So now what we're gonna do is we are going to put on the side panels, which is three and three quarters inch. And we'll do that on either side and then we'll trim it out on the front side. And that'll be pretty much it other than the painting portion. So we're, it, this is working out really great. Okay, so you can see that there is like an exposed edge right here, but that is not gonna be a problem now because we are gonna take some trim and cover that up. And on the side, it will be nice and seamless, especially once we caulk it. So this is gonna be how we finish it off. Okay, so here's what we've got going on. So I first made sure of where I wanted the fireplace to be, and then I took a pencil and marked on either side of it so I knew where to cut. Then I took my oscillating tool and started cutting down that line, and then Dolly darted in. I made the mistake of leaving the door open. She darted in to protect me. I quickly <laughs> turned it off, got her out, shut the door, and then finished cutting out these cuts right here. And then I scored along the line with with my utility knife. And then I just took a putty knife and a hammer and pried it back, it came back super easily. And then we had our section out and I put it back in just to make sure it fits and it does. So then once we did that, I taped off where the outline of the fireplace will be because we are gonna take out this section of carpet. <laughs> I'm a little nervous about that, <laughs> but we have no intention of keeping this carpet for very much longer. Um, the sooner the better. Replacing all the flooring upstairs where our beds and my craft room and all of that is kind of an undertaking. So we're not ready to do it right now, but I don't want to have to worry about this down the road. So what my plan is, is we're gonna just cut out a section, leave a little bit of a lip, and then I'll just take a utility stapler and staple it down into place temporarily. Hopefully that will work just underneath. My goal is to drop down our fireplace by a quarter of an inch, which is how much too tall my over mantle is. <laughs> so I'm hoping some of these little tweaks will get us that little bit. And if not, then I get some more brainstorming to do. So I'm just gonna start doing this. Okay, so here's where we're at with this. So what I ended up doing is I cut back the pad so it's gonna sit barely right underneath the pressure of the fireplace. I made sure that the tack strip is cut back past this point so that it doesn't um, inhibit our ability to push it down. But we've got a little issue here, you know, we don't want this loose because we're not 
replacing the carpet immediately. So what I've got here is we are going to use this carpet tape that I used for my rugs. We're gonna run it along the perimeter of this. And then I'm also gonna shoot in a couple of nails to tack it into place. Those will easily rip through once we yank on it. But in the meantime, it should hold it down in place enough for it to withstand like vacuuming around it and all of that. So I think we're gonna be okay for the temporary solution. Okay, so you can see that I'm putting these metal straps on either side, and then I'm also going to, um, from the underside, screw up into this with some, some longer screws, and so hopefully it will be secure when we push it back. Okay, so I have a little issue. Up here, it's kind of leaning on the corner, so I don't know if this is warped or what. You, if you stepped back, you wouldn't, I'm gonna trip on something here. Uh, if you step back, you don't really notice, but it will bother me because especially since we decided to build this in. So here's what my plan is to rectify the kind of warped little corner here. I think the wall is level. I don't know if it's just the way it's sitting or maybe this is warped or it's just not sitting flush on this one corner. And had I been intentionally planning to do this the whole time to build it in, my, my original intention for this was to make this completely removable, which I think you still could do. I mean, like as of right now, it looks really good and I could disassemble it and take it with me to the next place other than the patch of carpet we removed. <laughs> but like if I had put this on a hard surface, this is totally removable. So if you're a renter, maybe this will give you a good idea however we're planning on leaving this it's staying and so the only way I see to do this properly is gonna require me to deconstruct a little bit <laughs> and I really I thought about this overnight I'm gonna have to remove some of these pieces of trims this paneling and then I'll reinstall it and reapply it but the only way to do this securely is to remove some of that paneling take this upper portion of the frame take my framing nailer shoot some nails into the the studs in the ceiling and get it really nice and secure because this is not going anywhere anymore. <laughs> and for those of you who are concerned about accessing the outlet behind here, we can still access that by pulling out the fireplace at any given time. So I'm not really worried about that. So we've got to do what we've got to do. So unfortunately, we're going to just disassemble it. I don't think it's going to take me that long. I don't think I have to completely deconstruct it, just certain sections so that I can get this secure to the wall and it really is the best way to do it. So here we go. <laughs>
we've got it all caulked and puttied. We're letting it dry and then it will be time to paint, which honestly is not that different than this color here. So <laughs> should be pretty easy. So next, since we were already working with primed pieces for the over mantle, we just painted the upper portion to match. We made sure everything was caulked and puttied really, really nice and really polishes it off. And then I used a good quality paint, Benjamin Moore, in the same paint color as my trim. This over mantle, it has been a project that I have been wanting to do forever. I knew that I wanted to do kind of like a miniature version of what I had downstairs. It really, really elevates the look of this room. I'm just thrilled. I love it. Well, 2023 was quite the year. Again, I started out with some health challenges. I really spent a lot of time focusing on my health. I launched a product line. I bought a new house. And so there is a lot coming in this next year, 2024. If you haven't subscribed to my channel yet, make sure you do so if you wanna see all the excitement that's going on. But until then, if you enjoyed this episode, here's another one that I think you'll like as well. And to all of my DIY goddesses out there, you are more powerful than you know. See you next time. Bye. Maybe it's time to take this down. Should we take this with us? I think so. It might look a little different though.